Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today we're talking to Ben Gertzel, who's actually one of the founders of the AGI research community. He's been interested in this area for decades, really long before most people were. And he's done a whole bunch of interesting thinking around what it's gonna take to build an AGI. We'll be talking about that a fair bit. We'll also be talking about his current AGI initiative, SingularityNet, which is taking a very different and some might say radical approach to building AGI that differs considerably from what we see at DeepMind and OpenAI. Instead of focusing on deep learning or reinforcement learning alone, Ben's taking an approach that focuses on decentralization, trying to get different AIs to collaborate together constructively in the hopes that that collaboration is going to give rise through emergence to artificial general intelligence. It's a very interesting strategy with a lot of moving parts, and it's going to lead to conversations about AI governance, AI risk, AI safety, and some more exotic topics as well, like consciousness and panpsychism, which we'll get into too. So I'm really looking forward to having this wide-ranging discussion with Ben, and I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for uh, joining me for the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. I think actually one of the areas that I want to start with, because I think it's sort of upstream of a lot of other things, and it's something that you know, people often talk about when is AGI coming? What's AGI going to look like? What are the risks associated with AGI? But I think upstream of that is a separate conversation about what intelligence is itself. And that seems like a, a hard thing to pin down. I'd love to get your thoughts on what, what you think intelligence is and how you define it. So I do think intelligence as a concept is hard to pin down. And I don't think that matters too much. I, I think for example, life is also hard to pin down as a, as a concept, and you could debate whether viruses are really alive or digital life forms or retroviruses are alive. And I mean, yeah, there's, there's some things that are really clearly alive and some things that it's much less useful to think of them as being alive, like a rock. And then there are things that are, are near the border in, in an interesting way. And, you know, biology didn't grind to a halt because we don't have an exact definition of, of, of life, right? And I, I think similar thing is true with cognitive science and, and AI. So I, I've gone through a bit of a, a journey myself in thinking about intelligence, but that's a journey that has made me, I guess, less and less enthusiastic about precisely defining intelligence mm. as being an important part of the quest. I mean, when I started out working on the theory of AGI in the 1980s, I mean, I, I wanted to have some mathematical conceptualization of, of, of the problem. So I started looking at basically, okay, intelligence is something that can achieve complex goals in, in complex environments. And I think that it's in the spirit of what Shane Legg wrote about in his thesis, Machine Superintelligence, much later, my conception was a little bit broader because he, he's looking more at sort of a reinforcement learning paradigm where an AI is trying to optimize some reward function. And you know, optimizing expected reward is only one species of goal achievement. You could say instead, I'm trying to optimize some function over my future history which isn't necessarily a, a average of reward. And you, you can also look at multiple objective functions and you're looking at, so Pareto optimizing multiple functions defined over your future history. And I, I think it, so going that direction is interesting. It leads you down some rabbit holes of algorithmic information theory and, and, and whatnot. Then on the other hand, you could look at intelligence much more broadly. So my friend uh, Weaver, David Weinbaum, had a PhD thesis at, from Free University of Brussels called Open-Ended Intelligence. And he's just looking at intelligence as a complex self-organizing system that is, you know, modifying and extending and transforming itself and, and its environment in a way that is sort of synergetic with its environment. And if you look at things from that point of view, you know, achieving goals is one thing that happens in a, in a complex self-organizing yeah. system of this nature, but the goals may pop up and then go and be replaced by other goals. And the synthesis and interpretation of goals is, is just part of the overall sort of cognitive self-organization process. So from, from that point of view, achieving complex goals and complex environments is part of the story. 
but it's not necessarily the whole story. And obsessing on that part of the story could maybe lead you in in bad de bad design directions. And you could look at the current focus on deep reinforcement learning and much of the AI community as in part being driven by an overly limited notion of what intelligence intelligence is. And of course, successes in that regard may tend to drive that overly limited definition of what intelligence is also. You can then go down the direction of, okay, how do we formalize the notion of open-ended intelligence? And mm -hmm. you can do that. And Weaver in his thesis wrote a bunch about, you know, category theory, algebraic topology formulations. But, but then, I mean, that becomes a whole pursuit on its own. And then uh, one has to think as a researcher, like how much time do I spend trying to formalize exactly what I'm doing versus trying to do things and, and, and build systems. And of course, some, some balance can be useful there because it is, it is useful to have a broader concept of what you're doing rather than just the system that you're, that you're, you're building at that, at that, point in in time on the other hand again going back to the analog with with biology i mean if you're trying to build synthetic life forms it is useful to reflect on what life is and the fundamental nature of metabolism and reproduction and so forth on the other hand the bulk of your work is not driven by that right i mean the, the, yeah. the bulk of your work is like how do i string these amino acids together so so i i'm attracted by that philosophical side on the other hand, you know, probably it's best going to be addressed in synergy with building stuff. So I don't, and it's interesting when Shane Legg, who went on to co-found Google DeepMind, was working with me in the late 1990s when he was my employee in WebMind Inc. Shane's view then was, well, if we want to build AGI, first we have to fully understand and formalize the definition of intelligence. And he called it cybernance right. at that point. And then then he published the thesis on machine superintelligence. And so he did, to his satisfaction, formalize the definition of, of general intelligence. Although I, I have a lot of issues with his definition, he was happy with it. Then, then shortly after that, he decided, but that's actually not the key to creating general intelligence. Instead, let's look at how the brain worked and, and, and follow that. So he, I guess each of us working in the field finds it useful to clarify in our own mind, something about how intelligence works. And then, yeah. then you go off and pull in a whole lot of other ideas to actually work on it. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. And I think one of the things that's really fascinating about, I think the approach that you're taking here is, it's almost as if it implies that the moment we specify like a, a loss function, or the moment we get too absolutist about what it is we're trying to optimize, it like, it creates room for pathology. Like it creates room for a, an almost kind of ideological commitment to a certain loss function, which maybe we don't understand. Is, is that like- Yeah, I mean, what, one, one thing you find in experimenting with even simple AI systems is, you know, like, just like a computer program has the disturbing feature of doing what you program to do, rather than yeah. what you want it to do. Like an AI system, given a certain objective function, it has the property of, figuring out how to optimize that objective function rather than the, the function you, you, you hoped you were giving it, right? So, I mean, it's common in game playing. Like if you, if you set an AI to play in a game, I mean, it, it doesn't care about the spirit of the game, right? It's just trying to find a way to win given whatever funny little loopholes there are in, in, in the rules of the game. And I mean, for a, a relatively simple game like chess or go, it's all good, right? Because there's not that there's not that many loopholes. The board isn't that big. There's not that many pieces. If you're looking at a more complex video game, I mean, very often an AI will find some really insane, weird looking like that that can't work, right? But but it but it does work, right? It's allowed by the rules of the game. And you know, I found this playing with AI with genetic algorithms for learning strategies for games a, a long a long long time ago, like in, in the in the 80s. I mean, as did, did others even, even before that. But that same phenomena, of course, occurs on a, on a, on a larger scale, right? And, and there's, there's a whole bunch of complex papers looking at pathologies of, 
you know, you, you're asking an AI to optimize a reward, but then it finds some way to optimize that reward that, that, that wasn't what you're thinking. And this, I mean, this ties in with wireheading, which is talked about in the transhumanist and, and, uh, and the brain computer interfacing community, right? So if, you, if, you, if, you, if your goal is to maximize pleasure, you know, define the stimulation of your pleasure center, then why don't you just stick a wire in your head and, and stimulate your pleasure center? But that, 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 that's very trivial, but there, there are sort of indefinitely versions complex of versions of that, of that pathology. That, that's, that's not an easy problem, right? Because you, you can look at it like, if you look at the broader issue, so I genuinely want an AGI that I create to, in some sense, I want it to reflect the values that I have now. And even if I say I don't want to fully agree with me on everything, I mean, the, the notion of fully agree, I want it to understand not fully agree in terms of my own, my own yeah. mindset, right? Like, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't want it to, like, slice all my children into little strips and stir fry them or something, right? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things I clearly don't want to happen. There's some ways that I don't mind the AI leading me in a different way direction than I, than I was thinking just as I want people wiser than me to lead me in different directions but formalizing the wiggle room I want the AI to have in deviating from my values is is, is also hard and then like if if I had an AI that had exactly the values I had when I was 20 I would be annoyed at that AI now let alone the exact values that the human race had in 1950 let alone 1500 right so you so you want the AGI even if we had an exact formulation of our values, we wouldn't want the AGI to be pinned to that forever, right? Yeah. But then we want its values to evolve over time in synchrony with us, but we're evolving in directions that, that we don't know. So how, to formalize all that is infeasible given tools currently are at our disposal, leading one to think that formalizing these things is hopefully can't be necessary and yeah. can't be the right way to do it, right? And that leads you in whole other directions. Like, okay, if if formalizing ethics and like pinning down an AI to formalized ethics and leads to all sorts of bizarre conundrums that are very far from resolution, maybe we take a step back and take a more loosey-goosey sort of human view of it, which is what we do with ethics in our own lives. And like if if we take early stage AGI systems and we're relating to them in a way involving positive emotional bonding, if if we have them doing beneficial things like education and 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 healthcare and uh, doing doing science and so forth, I mean then then are we qualitatively moving that AGI in a positive ethical direction ra ra rather rather than trying to approach it by formalizing our our goals in some precise way and then guaranteeing that the ai won't deviate from goals except in the ways we want it to deviate from them which we also can't formalize right so well, there's a, but that i mean that's both satisfying and, un, and unsatisfying right and but that, that seems to be the the reality as i see it now and do you think, because there's a sense I, I keep getting from this, as you described, like our, our morality has shifted dramatically over the last 500 years. There are things we do today that we take for granted that would be considered morally abhorrent like 500 years ago. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my mom is gay. She would have been burned at the stake, right? Right, uh, right. I, I, mean, I mean, clearly. And right right now, I mean, I, I eat meat every day with some moral misgivings, but I could, yeah. it's easy for me to imagine in 50 years, especially once synthetic meat is a thing that really yeah. works and that almost works now. It's easy for me to imagine now that people will look back on eating hamburgers the way we now look back on cannibalism. And we're like, oh, but the burger tastes good. But yeah, I mean, the, the Stone Age tribesmen might've been like the other guy's upper arm tastes good, right? So, right, and I mean, to the degree that like the, cosine similarity basically between our moral fabric today and the moral fabric of like 1500s or 1300s Europe or, or wherever we've come from is basically zero there I mean they're not it's not zero fun. like kinship kinship is value we love our parents and our children we we, we love we love our wives and we 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 don't want to torture our own bodies like that there is there is a core of there is a core of hum of humanity there but the the subtle thing is 
what we identify as that core right. is not what they would have identified in 1500. They would have been like, belief in God is the core, right? And to right. me, I'm like, no, that's that was just some random nonsense you believed back then. That, that, was, that wasn't the core, right? So and it's I a, guess... I guess yeah. we do have populations too that would look at, you know, there are individuals within humanity who would say, you know, it's, it's morally bad to love your family. Like I'm sure you can find out of 7 billion people, a handful who would argue for that. Like, I guess part of what I'm of wondering course. is- there, there, are, there are transhumanists who, 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 right. who believe that. Yeah, because that's, that's tribal thinking, which is holding us back from, from moving on to, a, to a, a, a broader singularity where you're not clinging to all this DNA stuff. So yeah, sure. So yeah, and I guess where that leads me is the question of like, whether you think uh, our moral trajectory, which is going to be, you know, AGI is going to be a part of that eventually, but is that trajectory, like is the process more important than the endpoint? Is it more about like the, the stepwise progression or do you think that there's actually like a subset of moral norms that will be preserved throughout because they're intrinsically good? Clearly the process of transformation is a lot of what's important to us right like, like we if we could upgrade our intelligence by any at any speed we would probably not choose to multiply our intelligence by 1000 every second because mm. we would just lose ourselves that's basically replacing yourself by a by a god mind right which could be a cool thing to do i mean if i if it was like either I exist or the God mind exists, maybe I'll decide the God mind should exist. But I mean, if if you doubled your intelligence every six months or something, then then it would be more satisfying from our point of view of our current value system, right? Because we're we're getting some we're getting continuity there. You're getting to experience yourself becoming a super intelligent God mind rather than right. It just happening and, and that I think that has to do with why we that has to do with why we feel like we're the same person we are when we were we were when we were like three years old like I mm. I remember back to around 18 months but the sense in which I'm the same person as I was at 18 months I mean of course you can cherry pick common personality traits there yeah. but the, the, the main thing though is each point I thought I was the same guy the day before and, and 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 the day after and just changed a little a little bit and there yeah. even even at a moment in your life when you have an incredible in, in, inflection point right like i mean i mean in a few times in my life i've been through some big sort of consciousness transformation where i felt like within a week i was a whole different person but still i didn't really think i was a whole different person right yeah. I, I still realized that like this is it's still been, I'm just in a different state of consciousness. And that, yeah, that continuity is important to us on, on a cultural level also, right? So we, we, and I think that will continue to be important to us going forward for a while. I mean, whether, whether we will lose our, our taste for continuity, mm -hmm. that's like a big question I don't have the answer for, right? You could, you could imagine the taste for continuity continuously going down year by year until by like 2100 we're just a super ai mind who really isn't attached to yeah. itself at all it doesn't care about upgrading its intelligence by by a factor of a thousand in in, in, the, in a second right but now now clearly we do, we do care about that and we that's going to drive the progress toward the singularity in a in a number of different of different ways right well, and so speaking of progress towards the singularity, there are a number of different organizations now working on that, that, that big project. Like two, I think two of the most maybe high profile in the media are OpenAI and DeepMind. I know you've had a, a lot of influence on DeepMind in particular in terms of the, the folks who work there today in the thesis. But I, I'd love to get your sense of, so first off, what, what's your mental model of how OpenAI and DeepMind are approaching AGI? And then how does that contrast with the singularity net? I mean, the uh, first thing I would say is I... I to, to me, putting those two in the same category is like putting, I don't know, Winston Churchill and Trump in the same category or something. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, they each have their own strengths, but I don't think those are really comparable organizations. And I, I think Google as a whole, mm. and not just DeepMind, but Google Brain and the Mountain View office, which is where Bert and Transformer Neural Nets, for, for example, came out of, and a whole lot of other valuable stuff. So I think Google as a whole has put together by far the best 
AI organization of, of any centralized company out there. I, I, I mean, there, of course, academia as a whole is stronger than, than any, one, any one company by, by, by a humongous amount in terms of coming up with, with new AI ideas. But if you're looking at a, you know, a company or a government lab, a specific organization, I mean, Google has just done a really good job of pulling in AI experts from a wide variety of, of different backgrounds. So, I mean, they have deep, deep learning people, they've pulled in cognitive architecture people, they've pulled in a whole bunch of sort of algorithmic information people. They, they got Marcus Hooder, who's invented mm -hmm. the general theory of general intelligence, right? So I think there's, a, there's really a great deal of, of depth there. I, I know there's some internal rivalry between the Mountain View and the, and the, and the UK people, but, but I think, you know, DeepMind is very strong. Google Brain and other teams in, in Mountain View are also very strong. Google in New York area is, is very strong. So all in all, there's a lot of depth there and there's a lot of different approaches being pursued behind the scenes, which are qualitatively different from the things that get a lot of publicity. So like I, my oldest son, Zarathustra, is doing PhD in, in uh, AI for automated theorem improving. So machine learning to guide theorem improving. And his supervisor, Joseph Urban, is an amazing guy, organizes AITP, AI for Theorem Proving Conference every year. You've got a bunch of Google DeepMind people there every year who are doing work on AI for Theorem Proving, connecting that with AI ethics and some of the things mm -hmm. we were talking about, about earlier. And that's uh, pretty much unconnected with, you know, video game playing or with the or with brain modeling or, or the things that the Demis Asabis per personally is, is into. So I, I think there's a lot of depth there. They really they want to create AGI, like L Larry and Sergey understand what AGI is and what the singularity is. Demis and Shane understand it very deeply. I think they are still at a high level, they're predominantly committed to deep reinforcement learning and sort of conceptual emulation of how the brain works in modern hardware as an approach to AGI. Now they are clearly open-minded enough that they've made hires of great people who do not share their, their predilection, which yeah. is to their credit, but still like the vast bulk of their machine is deep reinforcement learning, you know, crunching a lot of data on a lot of machines and trying to figure out what the brain is doing and figuring out ways to sort of do the same kind of thing in neural nets on, on a lot of GPUs, right? And so I think if if that approach is going to work, it would shock me if Google weren't the ones weren't the ones who 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 got there. Actually, I mean, I mean, I think, uh, and now I happen to think that is not the best approach, which which is 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 is, is a different topic, right? Now, op OpenAI, on the other hand, you know, I I don't know them as well, but I, my wife who's also an uh, AI PhD. My, my, my wife and I, actually, I'm not an AI PhD. I'm a math PhD. So mm -hmm. she, she's more of a certified AI expert than I am. But we went to OpenAI's unconference a few years ago in, mm -hmm. uh, in San Francisco. And, you know, it felt like a room full of super high IQ, brilliant, passionate, like 25-year-old guys or younger who thought, and mostly guys, literally, who, who thought that, AI had been invented about five years previously and that back propagation was the only AI learning algorithm there. And like, I, I, there's a few guys there who were like, well, for our hackathon project this weekend, we're gonna, we're gonna map, we're gonna enable natural language based authoring of Python programs, right? So we're gonna train a seek to seek neural network to map, uh, map and Ellen to Python after three days of hacking day and night, night like, well, we, we found the irregularities in natural language are a bit more complicated than anticipated, right? Like uh, they really, these guys didn't know that, that the, they didn't know that linguistics or computational linguistics had anything to say, or they may not have known it existed as a field. Now, of course, I mean, Ilya Sutsker, of course there were guys in, in open AI who were very, very deeply knowledgeable, but I felt yeah. at that at that stage, OpenAI was sort of like a deep neural nets only shop. And they were just hiring more and more people to, to bang on that, to use that one hammer to bang whatever they could, which is the exact opposite of what, what, 
what DeepMind and, and Google Brain have done. And then, I mean, the whole thing of GPT-2 is too dangerous to release because it's going to destroy the world. I mean, I mean, spouting bullshit is bad, but it's not going to destroy. It's not going to destroy the world, right? And that that was invented in Google anyway. I mean, that's that's just transformer net to me. That's just yeah. I mean, that's just burnt in one direction, right? And so I mean, now actually, you know, for some of my, I'm working on a number of things. I'm working on a bunch of AGI research that we'll talk about in a few minutes, and I'm all. Also working on some applied practical AI projects. Like well, one thing we announced yesterday is this a robot called Grace, which is an, an el elder care robot, a collaboration with Hanson Robotics. And so that's supposed to go into elder care facilities and hospitals, provide social and emotional support, some practical functions. But for in that project, like I, I want to launch that before I get to AGI. I need a practical dialogue system. I wish we could use open AI stuff. I wish we could use GPT-2 or 3 but a high percentage of what they say makes no sense. It's just bloviating bullshit. And then you can't put that in an elder care robot, right? So, uh, so I mean, we, you, you, you see the, these things that they were claiming are going to destroy the world because they're so human-like. They're not even really, they're not good enough to use in, in almost any practical projects now. And I, I would say DeepMind has not done that either. On the, on the other hand, open... GPT-2, I didn't mind so much because they hadn't gotten their payday yet, right? But now, now they're already bought by Microsoft. So what, what, why, do they, why do they still need to overblow things? It's, a, it's not financially necessary anymore, right? And, <laughs> and what is it that you think uh, means that or prevents GPT-3 from, from performing at the level that it needs to? I mean, is it, is it a symbolic... Uh, it has function? no idea what it... It has no understanding of anything that it's talking about. It is... My friend uh, Gary Marcus, who's working with uh, on the uh, ro ro robust AI with Rodney Brooks, he 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 put it beautifully in his article, like GPT three bloviator, right? I mean, it just it just spouts stuff that sounds plausible, but it has no idea what it's what it's talking about. And so, I mean, it, you can see, like with multiplying numbers, you know, it can multiply do two by two multiplication. When you get up to four by four multiplication of, of integers, it's right like 15 or 20% of the time or something. That's just really, really weird. Like if you know the algorithm, you're right almost 100% unless you make a stupid error. If you don't know the algorithm, you should be 0%, right? But what it did, it looked at all the multiplication problems online. It memorized the answers. And then it came up with some weird extrapolations that let it do a few problems that weren't in its it's training database, right? It's, but it doesn't understand what multiplication is, or it would never get like 15 or 20% multiplication problems, right? And you can, you can see that in many other cases. Like you ask it, like, you know, who, who, who were the best presidents of the US? It'll answer a lot of good things. Then it'll throw a few Kings of England in there just for fun. But I mean, because it doesn't know what of the US means. So you, the thing is, you, in the end, it has no more to do with AGI than my toaster oven does. Like it, it, it's not, it's not representing the knowledge in a way that that will allow it to make consistently meaningful responses. And there are. That's not to say that everything in there is totally useless for AGI. It's just that like you're not going to make GPT four, five, six, seven and get AGI. So I mean, there's. There's very interesting work on tree transformers where you use like a constituent grammar to bias the generation of a transformer network. And then I've been playing with something like that where you use a whole knowledge hypergraph. You can use a knowledge graph, which is dynamically constructed based on what's been read to guide the generation of, of the transformer. And, and then, then you have some semantic representation, some knowledge that, that's, that's playing a role in, in the generative network. So I mean, there, I, I think- And that's an open cog, right? Or that sounds like- it's Yeah, 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 yeah. So, th th so there's some of the ideas and tools and transformer networks may end up being one component among others in a, in a, a viable AGI architecture. But on the other hand, open AI is not working on those things from what I know. I mean, from, from what I could see, their philosophy is mostly take the best AI out of the literature and implement it at very, very large scale with a lot of data and a lot of processors. And then it will do 
new and amazing things. And the, the thing with that is it's semi-true. Like that there's so much in the AI literature that gave so-so results and will give amazing results once once you run it on enough data and enough processor time. But you know, you usually need to rejigger the architecture and rethink things and add some important new features while you're in the process of doing that that scaling up. Like so I like I was teaching deep neural networks in the the 90s in University of Western Australia. I taught a class in neural nets, cross-listed computer science and psychology department back when I was an academic. We were doing like multi-layer perceptrons with, with wow. recurrent back propagation. We we're teaching deep neural nets. And you could see you needed to scale up massively because you were running a neural net with like 50 neurons and it took all your processor time for hours, right? But the process of scaling it up, it wasn't like take that exact code and idea and run a lot more machines. Like still people aren't using recurrent backprop, right? They, they, came, they came up yeah. with, other, with, 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 with other methods. So at, at the very high level, I sort of do think we can get to AGI by taking ideas we have now and scaling them up on on massive number of machines with a massive amount of data. But when you're in the weeds, that scaling up involves reinventing a whole bunch of new math and algorithms kind of in the spirit of what was there before. And I I, I think uh, OpenAI is so far sticking a little too closely to like, let's let's actually take what someone else invented and just just the, the literally scale it up on, on more machines with, with, with more with more data, right? And that's uh, it leverages their position very well in that they have a lot of money, a lot of data, and a lot of a lot of computers, right? But mm -hmm. but I, I think I think we need I actually I don't think we need necessarily humongous conceptual revolutionary breakthrough to get to AGI, but I, I think we need more creativity than that than, than, than that right and so that that's well, that leads on to my own agi work I guess. yeah i was gonna say maybe that that gets us to open cog to singularity net um and and i think this is entangled too with with the next question i did want to ask which is what are some of the risks that you see coming from agi i know you've been generally more optimistic maybe than some of the, the yeah. hardcore pessimists in the community but um you see some risks and, and i'm curious how that plays into your own view about what the most promising route to agi would be yeah yeah i mean the the there's two categories. Let me address the risk thing first, because once I start talking about OpenCog and true AGI, it's hard to stop. So, the, <laughs> I mean, there's two categories of risks in 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 my, in my view. So, what one risk is the sort of uh, Nick Bostrom style risk, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you do your best to create an ethical AGI using all your your math theory and your 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 loving care and common sense and and getting all the politics right. And then, you know, you still can't reduce the uncertainty to zero when you're creating something that's in the end more generally intelligent than you are, right? I, I mean, there's, there's no matter how optimistic you are, like there's, there's some odds that there's something you can't foresee that, that's going to that's gonna un, un, unfold there. And I mean, I, I don't buy Nick's argument that a superhuman AGI is gonna intrinsically have a drive to turn us all into computronium to make more hard drive space for itself. I mean, the, the whole drive to be megalomaniac and consume all resources and, and, and uh, you know, squash your enemies. This, this is not something that necessarily is there in an engineered system by, by any means. Is but I but still, looking at that as an, like an instrumental goal though that emerges like- No, I don't think it has to emerge at all. No, I, I think that's <laughs> bullshit. I, I mean, I think, I think that emerges in systems that evolve through competition or through some complex mix of competition and cooperation. But if you're engineering a singleton mind, say it doesn't have, to, it's not competing with anything, right? It just doesn't, it didn't evolve in that competitive way. So it doesn't have to have that, that motivational system. So I, I don't, I don't think the drivers that cause humans to be that way have to be there for an AGI because I mean, you know, you and I could compete, but we, but we can't, we can't merge our brains if we want to, to become a super organism. Two, two AGIs that started competing could decide to merge their brains in, 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 instead, right? I mean, so the, I, I, I don't think, 
I don't think that logic applies to systems that are engineered and don't don't evolve in, in, in the way that, that, that we did. So, but on the other hand, I have to say there's an irreducible uncertainty in creating something like a hundred times yeah. smarter than me, right? I mean, we it, it may, you know, for all you know, it could immediately make contact with some even more super intelligent that's imminent in in the quantum fluctuations of elementary particles that we think are random. Right. And that that other AI that it contacted could be good or bad from a human point of view, right? So there, there, there's that, there's an irreducible uncertainty, which is really hard to put a probability on. And to me, I mean, there's also an irreducible uncertainty that I wake up in five seconds and realize like I'm a brain in a vat in some other universe, right? So that, I mean, there's, there's, there's irreducible uncertainties all around if you, to reflect on them. But then the, there's a more concrete risk, I think, which is that, I mean, humanity could develop malevolent or indifferent AIs in a pretty directly, simply comprehensible way, even before you get to massive super AI. And so this, this gets down to my oft made observation that the main things that AIs are used for in the world today are selling, killing, spying, and crooked gambling, right? I mean, so, I mean, that you're advertising, you're doing surveillance, military, and you're doing like Wall Street trading. And so if if this is what's shaping the mind of the baby AGI, you know, maybe maybe it will it will end up being a, you know, a greedy megaloma, megalomaniacal sociopath reflecting the uh, the cognitive structure of the corporate and government organizations that, that gave that gave rise to it, right? So, I mean, that's, that's a palpable risk, right? I mean, you, you, you could see if, if Earth AGIs are spy agencies, Wall Street traders, and advertising companies, which are exacerbating global wealth inequality. And then, I mean, you've got a bunch of people in the developing world who have no jobs anymore because robots in the developing world took their jobs. So they're being subsistence farmers and, and computer hackers, right? So, I, I mean... You, there's a lot of there's potential dystopic scenarios that don't need any super AGI, and that from some points of view would be even look like the most likely scenario given the given the nature of world politics and and technology development, right? So, which also I mean, seems to sense. which also seems to kind of motivate your approach, right? I mean, the, the decentralized yeah, that, that certainly motivates my approach, and and I think the. This ties in with AI algorithmics in a subtle way. That's not not that subtle, but subtler than is commonly appreciated. Because I, I think big tech companies, even the more beneficial oriented ones run by good hearted human beings, they are focusing on those AI approaches that best leverage their unique resources, which is huge amounts of data and huge amounts of compute power. So if you look at the space of all AI algorithms, maybe there's some they don't need that much data or compute. And there's some that need a lot of data or compute. The big tech companies, they are sort of have a fiduciary duty to put their attention on the ones that require a lot of data and, and compute because that's where they have more competitive advantage mm -hmm. over everyone else. And, and they have such, if you're working in one of those companies, the APIs for leveraging their data and compute power are really slick and so much fun to work with. Like if you're working at Google, I mean, simple command and and you're doing like a query over the whole web like that that, that that's amazing right yeah. so i mean i mean of course you've got you've got a bias to use those tools but the result is that the whole ai field is being pushed in a direction which is hard to do if you're not inside a big tech company and it's a valid direction but there may have been other directions i think there are that don't need as much data or compute power but those don't have nearly such slick tool chains associated, associated with them. So for a developer like Open, OpenCog that I'll talk about in a moment is kind of a pain in the ass to work with. TensorFlow is much easier to work with. That's not entirely for fundamental reasons though. Like we don't have the, we don't have the UI developers. We, 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 don't have, we don't have all the, all the, all the team that's needed to make parallelism scale up automatically, right? So the approaches the big, temp, big tech companies like have slicker tools associated with them. So they'll attract more developers, even out of the ones not working for those big tech companies. So what happens is, and of course, if you're a PhD student, if you write a PhD thesis that matches what a big tech company is doing, 
I mean, you're more likely to get a good job right away. So why not do that? It's also interesting, even though there's other interesting stuff. So the whole AI field is sucked into what's valuable for these companies doing, uh, you know, selling crooked gambling, spying and, and, and supporting, you know, murder activities by national governments. It's, it's funny and, how I, common these effects are. I mean, I'm just sorry. I'm just thinking back to like my time in academe in in physics where I was studying interpretations of quantum mechanics. Yeah. And it was like, that's like a great career ender. If you ever want a, a, a career ending thing to study is like go into fundamental like quantum mechanics. And it's the same. This is sort of, anyway. Sort yeah, of yeah. And, and that, that's an area I've, I've, stu I've, stu I've studied a lot and there's a lot there's a lot of depth in the interaction between that and quantum computing. I mean, that, 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 that's, yeah. a, that's a whole other, whole other fascinating topic. And I, I think, you know, reinforcement learning, it suits really well a company which has a sort of metrics oriented mm -hmm. business model and supervised learning does as well. So like if you're running an advertising company, sales of all kinds is all about metrics like how many how big is your product line how many deals have, have you closed you know this this advertising channel like how 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 good it has has the has the the roi been right and it's so like the, and wall, wall street obviously as well one of the beautiful things about working in computational finance i mean i like it as a geek it's cool because you get immediate feedback and what your algorithms are doing as opposed to medicine where it can be years to get feedback but because these business areas are metrics oriented, that's really driven AI toward things like supervised learning and reinforcement learning, where you're you're optimizing these quantitative metrics all the time. And it's it's not that that's bad or invalid, but it's it's not the only thing that you can you can do in advanced AI or or or, or AGI. So I mean, other things like say hypothesis generation, which is important yeah. for medicine or science, it's just nastier to to quantify computational creativity in general so like google deep dream got a lot of news it's creative compared to a lot of things but in the end it's just combining pictures that were found online right it, it's not that creative but computational creativity it's hard to put a hard to put a metric on it and it's, ai it's development has been driven by you know these metrics driven business models now there's there's some good about that, right? I mean, having a metric lets you cut through your your internal bullshit in in, in, in certain ways, and it it can it can drive progress. On the other hand, it also drives progress away from valuable things. Like my my mom spent her career running social work agencies, and she was always fed up by you know these uh, philanthropic organizations. They would only donate to nonprofits. That were demonstrating progress according to metrics, but yet it's very, very hard to show your progress according to metrics if, if, if you're doing, say, enrichment education for low income single mothers or something. I mean, the metrics unfold over years and it costs a lot of money to follow up the people and, and, and see yeah. how, they're, how they're doing. So the result there is philanthropic organizations prefer to donate to breast, breast cancer or something where you can, you can, quanti you can quantify progress. So that, that this is. The thing is, focusing on quantifiable progress yeah. is good, but it but it pushes you to certain things. And in AI, AI, it's pushing you to reinforcement learning, where you're doing you're doing reward maximization, and it's pushing away from education, healthcare, and science, where things are are it's harder to immediately quantify. That's what I see as a short term danger, and in a way. In a way, focusing on the long-term Nick Bostrom danger is valid. In a way, it's a disinformation campaign to distract your attention from the short-term danger. So when, when a big tech company tries to get you to pay attention to super AGI, it might kill you 50 years from now. I mean, and sponsors conferences on that. Partly, it's a way of distracting your attention from the damage they're causing in the world at, 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 this, at this exact moment, right? So there's... Although there's a valid aspect to it too, so that I mean, the world is world is very tangled up, right? So. Yeah, it's it's funny how often problems come down to the fact that important things are often hard to measure, 
And when we score the functioning, for example, like the economy in terms of the stock market or GDP or some metric that's easily- GDP you know, is going up a lot this quarter, right? I mean, right, that's very, yeah. very, very exciting. What's and, the problem? Everything's great, yeah. <laughs> well, and you, you and I are probably doing okay, right? I, I, I mean, right. I, I'm not complaining personally at, at, at the moment, but I can see, you know, overall there's- It's a metric that feels profound, like profound a mess, profound economic, economic issues and i can yeah. see like my my sister's a school principal and there's you know low income low income kids who are just sitting at home watching tv all day getting no education and there's going to be a lot of ramifications to that but ha hard to measure gdp going up is easy to measure huh? right now i i do want to kind of tack into sort of the uh, the last area i want i really want to make sure we can touch on which is which um, ai risk mitigation strategies you think are most promising I'm going to focus maybe on the short-term risk that you've highlighted in terms yeah. of yeah. Well, let me let me say a little bit about my own AGI work now because that 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 will that will tie into that. So yeah. I, so I, I think uh, so my my approach and my feeling since the late '90s has been that what I would call a hybrid approach to AGI is going to be most successful and. There were architectures in the 80s called blackboard architectures, where you had sort of a, you view, there were blackboards back then, now they're whiteboards, right? Or Prometheus boards, they have a lot of things. But so you, you have a, imagine a blackboard and you have a bunch of experts in different areas and they're all writing on the same blackboard and they're all erasing what each other wrote and they're collectively doing, doing a proof or making a picture or something. So mm. I think each of the historical AI paradigms, which I would say neural net supervised learning, unsupervised learning, lo lo log logical inference and uh, ev evolutionary learning and a number of others, each of these paradigms, in my view, is sort of like one of the blind men grabbing part of the elephant of intelligence. Like one guy's grabbing the nose, the other, the other guy is, uh, is pu pulling the ears. Mm -hmm. one, one guy is pulling on the, the others or something, right? So, I mean, I think each of the traditional AI paradigms is getting at a key part of what we need for human-like general intelligence. And given that, so one approach is, is to try to find ways to make one AI paradigm incorporate what's good about all the other ones, right? So make a neural net, do logical reasoning and do evolution. Another approach is to come up with some new meta algorithm that sort of incorporates what's good about all these different and that that's very appealing to me personally actually but the the approach i think is probably going to succeed first is a hybrid approach where you're letting algorithms coming from these different classical ai paradigms cooperate together in real time on updating a common knowledge base and i think i think that work in that direction ultimately it's going to lead to what looks like a single meta algorithm that incorporates the, the best of, of what comes from these different paradigms. But I think we're going to get there by, by actually hybridizing different algorithms from different classical AI paradigms and how, having them work together. So in, in OpenCog architecture, what we do is have, we have a knowledge hypergraph. So it's a weighted labeled hypergraph. Actually, it's a metagraph, not a hypergraph. Because so can, you, can you define those things? Yeah, like I was yeah. about to. A graph has nodes with links between them, right? Okay. A hypergraph has nodes with links, but a link can go between more than two nodes. Like you can have a link spanning three nodes or something. A metagraph, you could have a link pointing to a link or a link pointing to a whole subgraph, right? So it's like the most abstract graph that you could get. So OpenCog Adam Space, it's a weighted labeled metagraph weights means each node or link could have a set of different quantitative or discrete values associated with it and labels these are types associated with, with with nodes and links and so we don't we don't enforce a single type system on on the atom space but you could have a collection of, of type systems on on, on the atom space so from a from a programming language view, it's like a gradual typing system or something where you could have something untyped or you could have something with a partial type and then the types could act even new types could be assi assigned via learning but but you can have you can have type checkers and that whole whole in instrumentation on there so it's a it's a weighted labeled knowledge hypergraph and then you allow multiple different ais to act on this knowledge hypergraph you know concurrently 
and this this is where things get interesting because if you have a probabilistic logic system and you have say a, a tractor neural net and you have a reinforcement learning system and you have say a automated program learning system these are working together on the same knowledge hypergraph i mean then you need them to be cooperating in a way that leads to what we call cognitive synergy which sort of means they don't screw each other up right i mean yeah. it's like basically if if one of them get one of the algorithm gets stuck the other algorithms should be able to help it overcome whatever obstacle it's facing that requires the various algorithms to be sharing some abstraction of their intermediate state with each other so it means some ab some abstraction of the intermediate state of each algorithm as it's operating on the knowledge hypergraph needs to be in the hypergraph it, 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 it's itself right so that and this is where the design gets subtle because doing everything in this hypergraph is slow yeah. but doing nothing in there means you just have a multi-modular system with no ability for each algorithm to see the other one's intermediate state so it's like what abstraction of its state what portion of each algorithm state goes in the hypergraph versus versus outside and this you know, in a neural net, for example, we develop what we call cognitive module networks, where you say if, if you break a deep neural architecture into layers or something, you may have a node in the hypergraph representing each layer and its parameters, mm -hmm. and the piping between layers happens in the hypergraph, but then the, the spreading of the back propagation inside a layer happens in, in some torch object that, that's, that's outside the hypergraph. Oh, so you're constantly right? bouncing back and forth between Yeah, but so the nice thing with torch is you have very good access to the, the compute graph on like in TensorFlow. So if you have two different torch neural nets, you represent them by nodes in the hypergraph. And if you compose those torch neural nets, that's represented by a, a symbolic composition of the nodes, the nodes in the hypergraph. So if your reasoning engine comes up with some way to, some new way to compose neural modules, that can be backed out to composition in Torch mm. and the, the compute graphs, the composition just passes through. So like in, in, ma in math terms, you have a morphism between the, the Torch compute graph and, 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 the, and the logic graph within, within, within the hypergraph, right? So, that, so that's, but there's a, there's a lot to work out there, right? So I'll just describe one little bit of it, which Alexei Polipov, who leads our St. Petersburg team published I guess last year in a paper on cognitive module networks, but you need you need similar thinking to that, like pairwise for each pair of, of AI yeah. algorithms, right? And so like how how does your how does your evolutionary learning algorithm make use of probabilistic reasoning to do fitness estimation? And there's so that it's the hybrid approach and it, it mostly has a steep learning curve, right? Because because yeah. you need to understand this this cross-cutting knowledge representation. And you have to understand all the algorithms that are that are playing are playing a role in it. So what where we're at now with that, actually, we came to the very painful and annoying conclusion that we needed to rebuild almost the whole OpenCog system from scratch. So we're OpenCog so we're, 2.0, this is? Yeah, we're calling we're calling OpenCog Hyperon. I decided to name the versions after obscure elementary particles instead of numbers. Like like L L Linux has all these funny animals or or Apple has uh, California suburbs, right? So, I mean, yeah, we're doing Hyperon. When we port to quantum computing, we'll make it Tachyon or something. There you go. So basically, it's about scalability. I mean, we can do yeah. whatever we want with the current OpenCog, but it's just, it's too slow in a few different senses. Uh, I mean, I, I think the, probably the most obvious thing is we need it to be massively distributed. Like now we can have a knowledge hypergraph and RAM on one machine, and we can have a bunch of hypergraphs share a Postgres data store in a sort of hub and spokes architecture, but we can't use the current system across like thousands or tens of thousands of machines. And ultimately, you know, for our work with transformer neural nets, we have a pretty big server farm with all these yeah. multi GPU servers. For OpenCog, we just can't use scalable infrastructure now. And it's obvious we need to. So part of our bet is just as happened with deep neural nets, like when you manage to scale them up the right way, whoa, look at what they can do, right? So right. we're thinking that once we've scaled up the OpenCog infrastructure, we're suddenly gonna see the system able to solve a whole bunch of hard problems that, that it hasn't been able to, to, so, to so far, right? So that's part of it is just scaling up the knowledge hypergraph. And of course, that mostly means scaling up 
the pattern matching engine to cross the knowledge hypergraph, right? Because I mean, just scaling up nodes and links isn't that hard. Getting the kinds of pattern matching we need to do, which significantly go beyond what current graph databases support, getting the kind of pattern matching we need to do to scale up across a distributed knowledge hypergraph. Yeah. Not, not, not impossible, but it, it, it's work, right? Then the, 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 the other thing is, and this is more interesting from an AGI point of view, from the work we've been doing, putting neural nets, evolutionary learning and logic together, we've just come to a much subtler understanding of how the knowledge hypergraph need, need, needs, needs to work. So we're, we're creating what's effectively a new programming language, which is, we, we'd been calling, we've been referring to atomies because in, in OpenCog, the nodes and links are called atoms. Atom is the superclass of the, of the node and link subclasses. So we'd in, informally referred to the, the dialect of scheme we were using, we have been using to create and manipulate nodes and links as atomies because both nodes and links are atoms. So this is atomies too. Maybe we'll come up with another, with another name, but we're understanding better what we need to do in terms of a type system and then a sort of family of index type systems inside the M space to better support integration of neural nets, reasoning, and, and, and evolutionary learning. And so this has led us to dig fairly deep into Idris and Agda and various of these dependently typed programming languages. So we're looking at sort of how do you do gradual probabilistic linear dependent typing in a reasonably scalable way. And because it seems like if you can do that, then you can get these multiple AI algorithms we're working with to interoperate sort of scalably and, and, and cleanly. And this comes down to like, how much of the operation of these AI algorithms can you pack into the type checker of like a gradual probabilistic linear dependently type language? Because like the, the more of the AI crunching you can fit into the type checker, then, then you can just make sure that type checker is really, really, if, efficiently implemented right and this yeah then this this ties in with which aspects of internal state of the ai algorithms are put into the into the into the knowledge knowledge hypergraph right so we're we're digging very deep into functional programming literature on mm -hmm. on on that on that side as well as into the distributed graph databases and i think i i think this this may be how in the end hybridizing different algorithms eventually leads you in the direction of, well, actually what I've ended up with bears little resemblance to the algorithms I started with. And, and we right. like have a, we, we have, we have a meta algorithm. So to, to start open cog hyper will certainly be a hybrid. Like we're going to keep using torch or, or if something better comes along. Right. And we're going to use our, our probabilistic logic network framework and we can make those work together, but it, it may be that after, a few years of incremental improvement there. Like we've modified the neural evolutionary and logical part enough that you just have some something some you, something you want to call sort of a different a different uh, more abstract yeah. learning algorithm. Because when you when you cash these things out at the category theory level, I mean the differences between a neural learning algorithm and a logic inference algorithm are much less than one than, than one would think when one looks oh, at them at the at the at the current implementation level so part of it is about having an implementation fabric where the the underlying commonalities between the algorithms from different paradigms are exposed in in, in, the, in the language rather than obscured which is 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 the current case yeah i was going to say that itself is really interesting because i generally at least i've seen it framed as an adversarial relationship this idea of you know neural learning versus symbolic learning or like symbolic logic and and what i find cool about this is you're really kind of fusing the two together and making them play nice in a very formal yeah way. and we've ar we've already done that in simple ways so like, I, I mean we, we have we have uh for example you have the nodes and links and the hypergraph and you can do embedding to embed a node in a, in a, in a, in a vector, right? And we, we do that, 
we tried deep walk and graph convolution networks. Actually, we're doing it using kernel PCA in a certain way now, some more, more traditional tools. But what you can, you can set that up so that you have a, a category theory, like you have a morphism between the vector algebra of the vectors and then, and then the, the probabilistic logic algebra on, 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 the, on the graph side. Wow. So what's interesting, if you're trying to do logic inference, you have some premises, you have a conclusion that you want to drive or try to drive from the premises. You can make a graph embedding as a vector of the premises, make an embedding of the conclusion. So then you have a vector for the premises vector of the conclusion. You can look at the midpoint. You can look at sort of the intermediate points along that, that vector. You, you map those midpoints back into the knowledge hypergraph and then you look at those as potential intermediate premises for the logic engine to do an inferring from the from the premises to the conclusion, right? So you're you're using the morphism between graph space and, and vector space as a method of logical inference control, right? And yeah. that that's uh, and that depends how you do that mapping. Because if you just straightforwardly use deep walk or GCN to do the mapping, you don't you don't get a, a morphism that that's that's accurate, right? So there's Interesting. so that yeah, there there's there's a lot of subtle things there. And I, I think I think once we I, I think we're gonna get rid of back propagation. And and as that is gotten rid of, you're gonna see that replaced with algorithms that map more naturally into, oh, into between things on the logic and, 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 and evolutionary evolutionary side also. So this this is another subtle point is playing around with infogan and other more subtle neural algorithms. So we've got an InfoGAN, which is a form of GAN that, that learns automatically these semantic latent variables on the generative network side. We've gotten that to do transfer learning between clinical trials successfully, which, which, which is pretty Whoa. cool. So like you, you, tra you train an InfoGAN network to sort of predict which, which patients in say a breast cancer clinical trial are gonna be helped by, wh by which medication. And then using an InfoGAN for that, the semantic latent variables there can be used for patient segmentation in a way that lets you transfer to a different clinical trial better. Uh, so a that, different clinical trial still on breast cancer, I assume, right? Yeah, it can be still on breast cancer, yeah. but maybe with different drugs. Interesting, uh, or, and, wow. or maybe a very different patient population, right? It might be, you can tell something even for different cancers. I mean, we're looking at tumor gene expression and there's a lot of similarity between the tumor gene expression data in cancers in different tissues, actually. But we've been looking at breast cancer mostly because there's more open data about that than, than about, oh. about other things. So that there we got it to work. But the, the, what I was coming to is if you try InfoGAN on like video data or something, the learning just doesn't converge. Right? Mm. And so then you give up and you're like, that's a bad architecture. But maybe it's not a bad architecture and backprop is just a bad learning algorithm. Right. So there, uh, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm suspecting that using floating point evolutionary learning like CMAES or something on these really complex neural architectures may work better. But if so, that gives you a lot to go on in cognitive synergy, right? Because once you're using an evolutionary learning algorithm, well, you can use inference for fitness estimation, right? I mean, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of openings for other AI tools in your hybrid system to help guide the the evolutionary learning in a way that's more challenging in, in, a, in a backprop framework. So yeah, this is this is uh, this is something I'm curious about, which is a purely technical point. Like how how many promising neural architectures are being discarded just because they're not suitable for backprop for, for back backprop, which is a very good algorithm, but has its strengths and weaknesses, like 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 everything else, right? So well. Maybe this ties in at least thematically with uh, another kind of contrarian position, at least as you were saying earlier, with respect to, I guess, the way AGI is looked at or AI is looked at or intelligence looked at in the West, which is, so we tend to take a, just a materialistic view of consciousness. But I do want to touch on this idea that, of, of panpsychism that you've been a fan of, which is almost as controversial in the West as like discarding backprop is. Did you mind kind of elaborating a little bit on panpsychism and maybe its connection to some of your thinking on AGI? If, if I will something? elaborate on panpsychism, but I, I have skipped the company I'm now the CEO of, which, which I must tell you about for a few minutes. So S Singularity yeah. Net, which is on it. So I've talked a lot about OpenCog and OpenCog Hyperon, right? And mm -hmm. That's something I've been working on a long time. Now, what I've been doing the last few years is leading this project called SingularityNet, which is 
it's a blockchain based AGI platform, basically AI platform, not just AGI, AI, AI, and and narrow AI both. So that that lets you basically operate a bunch of Docker containers, each of which has an AI algorithm satisfying a certain a API in it, and then these Docker containers can coordinate together. They can outsource work to each other. They can rate each other's reputation. They can pay each other. And someone can query the network and there's a peer to peer mechanism that passes the query along through the network to see if there's anyone who can do what that query asked for. But the whole thing works without a, without any centralized controller, right? So it's a, it's a society of minds as AI pioneer Marvin Minsky was talking about. And, but, and why is that important, by the way? So, so why? Uh, yeah, why yeah. So th this this ties back to the more political industry structure aspects we we were talking about, right? Because it's important because as we move from narrow AI toward AGI, we're going to be a lot better off as a species if the emerging AGI is not owned or controlled by one actor, because any single actor is is corruptible, and I'm. I'm not very corruptible, but if some thugs come to my house and, and, and threaten to murder my children, if I don't give them the, the private keys to my repository, then I probably am corruptible, right? So mm -hmm. I would rather not be in that position or anyone be in that position, right? So I, I think we want the early stage AGI as it evolves, I think we want it to be more like Linux or the internet than, than like say, O -O -O OSX or, or some company's private in internal network. And to enable that is challenging, right? Because you're talking about like runtime systems that are using a lot of RAM and, and, and processing power and data and, and network and, and so forth. So SingularityNet is a platform that allows a bunch of different nodes in a distributed AI network to cooperate and operate in a, in a purely decentralized way. And it's it's out there now. It's not as sophisticated as, as it will be. I mean, we're we're working with Cardano blockchain. Right now, it's implemented on top of Ethereum blockchain. We're moving a bunch of the network to Cardano blockchain, partly because it's faster and cheaper, but partly because we're introducing some more abstract features that Cardano supports better because their smart contracts are in Haskell, which is a nice abstract language. So we're, we're, looking, we're looking at how does one AI in the network describe at an abstract level what it does to the other AI in terms of the resources it, it, it uses, the data it takes and spits out, but also like what properties it's, it's, it's processing fulfills. So we're introducing a, an abstract, like dependent type theory based description language for AIs to describe what they're doing to each other, which is supposed to make it easier for one AI to reason about how to combine other AIs to, to do something, right? So from if we compare to OpenCog, in OpenCog, you have this knowledge hypergraph and multiple AI algorithms are tightly integrated on top of it because they have to all understand what each other are doing semantically. Mm. Singularity is looser integration, right? You have multiple different AIs in the network. They have a, they communicate by a description language that tells, how, tells what each other are doing and, and why and what properties they obey. But in the end, they can be black boxes. They can have their own knowledge, knowledge repositories and exposing certain properties. And so I think... I think we want both of those layers. Like you want a society of minds layer with multiple AIs that are semi-transparent with regard to each other. And then within that, you'll have some things that are doing more narrow functions like processing certain certain data types or, or doing certain kinds of optimization. And you have some AIs in that network that are serving more general intelligence type functions, just like we have a cortex then we have a peripheral nervous system and the cere cerebellum and so forth. So in, the, in that landscape, OpenCog is intended to power the agents that run in Singularity Net Network doing the most abstract cognition okay. stuff. But we want a lot of other things and they're complementing them. Because I was going to ask, yeah, how does the how does the coherence then emerge from Singularity Net? It sounds like then it's like Open, OpenCog gives you that coherence, gives you that high level reasoning and then outsources tasks through singularity net through the blockchain to other AI. Yeah, and stuff. you can deploy open cog through singularity net, right? So I mean, you can have multiple different open cog agents running in, in singularity net, but it doesn't, from a, from a pure singularity net point of view, open cog doesn't matter. Like people could deploy whatever they want in there from, from the view of like why I personally created it in, in, in the first place, 
it's partly because you want a decentralized open way for your open cog systems to cooperate with with, mm-hmm. with with a bunch of, of other things so yeah we we singularity net is run by a it's a nonprofit foundation it's more like ethereum foundation we've actually we've spun off a for-profit company called true agi which is sort of working on building systems using the open cog hyperon framework so that's sort of like a oh cool like a Linux Red Hat thing, right? Where OpenCog Hyperon is is open, but just as Red Hat commercialized stuff on top of Linux, True AGI is commercializing, well, working toward commercializing uh, systems that are built using OpenCog Hyperon and 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 Singularity Net. So yeah, there, there's a lot of layers there, and th- this this actually ties in with your questions about panpsychism and consciousness in a, in some emergence, some some, some in, in, in indirect ways, because I I think. Yeah, part of the idea underlying panpsychism, which is the sort of the philosophical premise that you know everything is conscious in in in, in its own way, right? But just just like in uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. I mean, in panpsychism, everything is conscious, but some things may be more conscious than others, or or, or, or differently conscious than 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 others, right? And so it's in in that point of view. You know, it can seem ridiculous to say that this coffee cup is conscious, but yet if you dig into quantum field theory, I mean, and quantum information theory, at a certain level, I mean, all these wave functions, they're interacting with the wave functions that are outside this system. They're processing it, they're processing information all the time, and they're incorporating that in some aspects of global coherent state as, 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 as well as local state. I mean, there's, if you try to boil down consciousness to sort of information processing or like distributed coherent awareness, it becomes hard to argue that these processes are absolutely not there in some, some physical object. Although you can certainly argue they're there to a greater degree in the in the in the human brain or, or or a mouse's brain, but if you're talking about a philosophical principle, like is yeah. there a conscious versus unconscious dividing line? It's not clear in what sense that that makes sense. Certainly, you can speak about abstract reflective consciousness, like self self modeling at a cognitive level, and we are doing that in a way in a way that this this cup is 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 not right so there there are some aspects of the natural language term consciousness that that humans have and, and a coffee cup doesn't have so what becomes subtle in thinking about consciousness is what what uh, chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness right so we have various sort of empirical properties we could talk about like can you model your mind in a practical sense and answer questions about what you're doing and 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 are you exchanging information with your environment and registering that information exchange in your global state you have all these all these sort of empirical properties of associated with consciousness then you have what are called qualia like the experience of of existing right right and what what many people do is they they correlate the experience of existing with sort of reflexive self-modeling, which the human brain clearly does in a way that a coffee cup doesn't. And I think the key aspect differentiating panpsychism from what's a more common view of consciousness in the modern West is as a panpsychist, you tend to think like the basic quelia, the basic experience I am is not uniquely associated with like reflective, deliberative, self-modeling type consciousness, but is rather it's associated with the more basic like information exchange type consciousness that that is imminent in, in every every physical system, right? And so that, that's a, that's not incredibly relevant to the everyday AI work that I'm doing now. It, it will become relevant when you start you know, building a femtoscale quantum computers or maybe even simpler quantum computers, it'll certainly become relevant when you start doing brain computer interfacing. But then you can ask yourself questions like, okay, this 
this computer that I've like wired into my head, right? Do I feel it there on the other end in the same way that I feel yeah. it if I wire another human brain in, into my head? Or does it feel like what I get when I wire a coffee cup into my head, right? Yeah. Because I'm guessing if I wire a coffee cup into my brain or, or Wi-Fi it, I'm not going to feel that much of what it is to be a coffee cup. Yeah. I guess if I wire my brain into yours and increase the bandwidth, I will feel a lot of what it is to be you, which will be weird, right? What if I wire my brain into like our version 3.0 of our, our grace uh, awakening health, like elder care robot, right? Yeah. Well, will I feel, you know, what it is to be an elder care robot? Will it feel something like what it is to be a human or will it feel like what it is to be a coffee cup, right? So I think that the, the rubber will hit the road with this stuff. And very interesting in terms of, so I think like singularity in it as a decentralized society of minds, or even think about human society and the global brain of computing yeah. and communication and, and human intelligence cloaking the earth right now. I mean, one could argue the real intelligence is this human, in human society and culture, and we're all just like neurons in the, in the global brain, like yeah. responding to what it sends us on the internet, right? But what kind of consciousness or experience does the global brain of the earth or would say a, a decentralized singularity in that society of, of, of minds have, right? Like you, so in a panpsychist view, you might say, well, an open cog system, it has a focus of attention, it has a working memory, you know, it, it's, its conscious experience will be a little more like human beings, although yeah. quite, quite different because it doesn't grow up with a single body that it's uniquely associated with. Something like a, a decentralized singularity net network, you know, might have its own general intelligence in a way that is exceeds an open cog or a human. Its conscious experience would just be very, very different, right? I mean, because it, it, yeah. it's not centered on a single knowledge base, let alone a single body. And th this gets back to your first question of like, what is intelligence, right? Because our whole way of conceptualizing intelligence it's overfitted to organisms like us that are, we're right. here to control, to control the body and get food and, and get sex and status and all the things that we do. An open cog system, even though it's very mathematical, ultimately it's built on the metaphor of, of human, human cognitive science, right? You got perception, action, long-term memory, w w work, working memory. I mean, it's uh, because that's what we have, that's what we have to go on. Right. But is that kind of intelligence, greater in a fundamental sense and that than that which would avert, emerge in a singularity net network that might you know get some self-organized emergent structures that we can't even understand and this brings us back to weaver's notion of, of open-ended in, in, in intelligence right so singularity net you would say is more of it's more of an open-ended intelligence approach toward agi where you're like everyone around the world put your stuff in there you know, have it describe what it's doing using an abstract description language. If it's going to flourish, it should get a lot of its processing by outsourcing stuff to others in the network rather than being solipsistic. And then, you know, it's trying to make money by providing services. It's hopefully providing its creator with, with some money, helping with, with income inequality if they're in a developing country. But what does this whole thing develop into? No one's scripting it, right? So that, yeah. that's also very cool. So I, if if the breakthrough to AGI happened in that decentralized way, would be really awesome and 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 fascinating. I mean the the open cog way is a little more determinate. Like we're architecting a system sort of model on human cognitive science. We're going to use it to control these these elder elder care robots, which even have human like bodies, like through a partnership of True AGI and, and the robot company. Mm -hmm. And so I mean I mean that's a a little, a little more determinate, and it may be a little of each, right? We don't, we don't know, we don't know how this is going to evolve because the the robots are going to draw on singularity and AI, including OpenCog plus other stuff on the back end. And from the robots' point of view, it will just draw on whatever works best for achieving its functions, and we'll see yeah. to what extent that's OpenCog versus some incomprehensible, like self-assembled conglomeration of, of of a thousand agents, right?
Well, it's, it's a, a beautiful and exciting vision and a very, a very open-ended one too, which is kind of interesting. I guess we'll all have to kind of wait and see how this develops. Yeah, vision yeah. is one thing. M making it work is what I'm spending <laughs> yeah. most of my time on, which is really astoundingly difficult. But it's, it's amazing the tooling that we have available now. Like you, you couldn't have done this when I, when I, you could have written it down when I started my career, but it would, each step would have just been so so slow in terms of compute time and human time using the crappy tools available at that time. So it's, it's amazing. This is all very, very hard, but it, it, it's amazing that we can, that we can even, even make progress on it now. Right. So it, it's uh, yeah. certainly well, a fun time to be doing uh, AI as, uh, as, as you, you and the, and the, all your listeners know. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's a great time to be learning about things like this too, all the different approaches to solving this problem. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing yours uh, with us. Do you have any um, any places where you recommend people go if they want to contribute to OpenCog or Singularity? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So probably our best developed media property is the Singularity Net. So if you go to singularitynet.io, you can you can and look at the Singularity Net blog and Singularity Net YouTube channel, which is linked from singularitynet.io. Like that will lead you to everything. But regarding OpenCog in particular. There's an OpenCog wiki site, and you can find by go to opencog.org, then go to the wiki, and there's there's a page of stuff on OpenCog Hyperon, which is our new system. There's the current OpenCog is 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 in is in GitHub. It's all open. And while I've been thinking a lot about the new version, the current version is what we're using inside these nursing assistant robots now. Like it it, it does something, and and we did. We, there are two online conferences that I organized earlier this year, which might be interesting. So one, one was the OpenCogCon online conference, which is just about OpenCog. Then every year since 2006, I've led the Artificial General Intelligence Conference, which has been face-to-face -face until now. But this year, the online, online AGI 20 conference, you, 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 can, you, can, you can find all the videos and papers from that online also. And that's some of my stuff, but also other things from the modern AGI community that I haven't had time to go into here. Well, great. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. It's something I'm sure a lot of people want to check out. And uh, Ben, thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, th thanks for your, thanks for the interview. It's a good good fun. You know, there's always more always more to cover than you possibly can. But uh, there's uh, some fun conversation.